All right, guys, so I'm going to start posting these little vlogs of me either like fixing something in the studio, building something for the studio, pretty much just like, you know, what I do when I'm not recording recreation tone videos because uh, a lot happens, <laughs> a lot of unexpected things happen. But uh, what's great about having a space like this is being able to fix things and get them working properly again. Today, I'm going to show you guys how I am going to restore a JCM 900 cab that I found here locally and my process with that. So hopefully that's interesting. And the only reason why I haven't posted recently was because my warm audio uh, 273 isn't working. The uh, second channel, the EQ for some reason is not putting out a signal no matter how hard I push the preamp or the output knob. It's just not working. So I have to send that out to Warm Audio. Luckily, I already contacted somebody there. They said they will take care of all the repairs and ship it back for free, but I just gotta get it out to them. It's currently Sunday, so I won't be able to do that until Monday when uh, FedEx opens. And then it'll be about a week, maybe two, before I can receive it back. And I feel like this is another thing that I wanna push this channel is to help people uh, restore things, you know? The DIY aspect of fixing guitars or speakers will help a lot of you because a lot of people have questions on forums that I find or groups on Facebook. And I learned a lot from that. Also watching other videos on YouTube. But yeah, we're gonna see how this goes. Hopefully you like it. Anyway, let's get uh, right into it. All right guys, so I just opened up the cab that I just purchased. Uh, turns out it has three original speakers in it and then a newer 75 in it. But the day codes on the back are a little rough. Let me zoom in for you. The stamps are a little, are not that great. I can make out the Y which stands for 91, which is perfect for uh, blood sugar sex magic tones. Or a B, this one looks a lot more like a B. But it's just faded at the top, and that's a Y, 491. So this, so these speakers should be from February 91, and then this one from uh, May of 94. Came with these really weird connectors from like uh, Home Depot. But uh, I'm gonna change that out and hopefully test these speakers. All right guys, so I had to pull the speakers out you know, and I figured, you know what, that the grill cloth is bugging me because it's not, it's like a thicker box cut and uh, I don't like it. So I'm gonna show you guys how you can replace that. So I'm gonna yank the front panel out and I'll see you back at my place. All right guys, it's currently dark out. Uh, I live in Arizona and it's really hot so it's the best time to do this type of work outside. I am pulling out the staples from the grill cloth. Luckily I have a staple remover. So you would just get in there well, that came out pretty easy. Anyway, if you don't have one of those, you can get like some sort of flathead screwdriver. Uh, I have this uh, chisel that also works pretty well. Just want to get below it and then pivot, pull it out. And then do that until you can get the grill cloth free so you can replace it. If it's damaged, if you don't like the color, I'm just going to use my staple remover. Got it off Amazon for like 10 bucks. Works very well. And I did most of the uh, staples already, I believe. Now to pull off the uh, Marshall logo, it's a little bit trickier. You don't want to damage it. I use the same staple remover. And the logo has like these uh, anchor points and you kind of want to find those. So you want to like scrape. Here's where I'm hitting like some sort of hard uh, anchor. So I'm just going to lift slowly, not all the way, just enough where I can get underneath the next anchor point, which is right, where is it? Right here. I'm gonna lift slowly. This one's giving me a little bit of trouble. There we go. You can see that little guy poking out. You wanna be careful not to damage it because these can snap pretty easily. There we go, that's free. You can see those anchors. So now it's just partial. Anyway, toss that aside. Now let's work on the logo cap. Yeah, that definitely has like a pivot or anchor. I mean, I don't know what to call it. Oh yeah, that's coming out pretty easily. There we go. Just pop that right off. Oh, it's got screws. All right, guys, it's day two. Uh, I just picked up the new grill cloth from Amplified Parts locally in Arizona. A helpful tool with regrilling these things is having a compressor with a air powered stapler. You can definitely do this by hand. You don't need this, uh, but I already uh, 
replaced a grill cloth of another cab a couple months ago and this was really helpful so luckily i get to use it again i bought one of these staple packets that come with different sizes and all i did was i got one of the older staples and just kind of eyeballed which one would be the best i already have the stapler loaded got to set up the tripod so you'll see me do that right now All right, for these uh, corner pieces, you want to get like this weird triangle. So you have the side flap, and then you have the uh, bottom flap right here. You just kind of want to pinch that down. It's best to have some sort of a burnishing tool. I have one somewhere, but I can't find it. I like the tension of the grill cloth. I don't think I need to mess with it anymore, so I'm just gonna seal these edges. And then you want to get both ends Like so. I want to get kind of like both sides. Something like that. And then for extra measure, I want to actually seal it down. You can have a little bit overhanging. But at this point, if you want to clean it up, you can. But I'm just going to. Look at it real quick. See something like this. You can probably just cut that right off if you wanted to. Just be careful. And that won't do you any harm. Or you can go ahead and staple it in more if you wanted to. But that's the finished cloth. Now it's time to put the logo back on. Sometimes it's easier to just puncture a hole to help you push these anchors in you know what that's as good as it's gonna get so I'm not gonna force it it's not gonna bug me unless it vibrates and then we'll have a problem well let's get the uh, the emblem on in the corner here all right so before I could put the emblem back on first things first uh, they are screwed in they're not really hammered in so what I need to do is take off the uh, this face plate off so I have this little screwdriver I'm gonna try to pry the logo out without bending the aluminum just feels like it's glued in there we go yeah it's glued in just work my way around easily there we go yeah it's glued in I'm gonna remove these screws Let me line this up for the camera. Okay, I see one hole right here, so I'm just gonna do a slight puncture to help the screws get guided in a little bit easier. And I'm gonna do this. Screw this bad boy in. There we go. It's still pretty sticky from the heat. If that falls off, I'll just super glue it back. And uh, I'm going to hit this with a little bit of uh, pressured ice air, what's remaining from the uh, compressor. And uh, get it nice and clean, and then you'll see me install this next back into the cabinet. Alright guys, we're back at the studio. Got the front panel over here. Uh, it's kind of a mess. I was working on a video. Uh, hopefully the uh, Imperian video sh should be out by now. If not, uh, stay tuned. I'm going to do an A-B comparison of JFX's Imperium against its vintage counterparts. Uh, so that'll either drop before or after this video. So like, comment, and subscribe if you don't want to miss that video. But uh, let's get back to the uh, main project over here. Alright guys, so I have the uh, front panel finally installed. The new screws catch onto the wood a lot better than the old ones. I also bought screws for the back panel also just in case. 
Uh, now is a good time to install the speakers, but before I do that, I actually want to test them and make sure they actually work before I actually put them in the cab. And let me show you how you can do that. All right, guys, so I have one of the speakers here. This is one of the uh, 1991 ones, 177 stamp on the back. Uh, this one's in one of the uh, not so good conditions. It's got a couple of uh, bumps and bruises. But uh, hopefully it sounds nice. But a good way to test out a speaker before you actually plug it into a guitar amp is you want to make sure that it is in the correct polarity before you plug in into an amplifier. The reason why is because when it has positive current, you want the speaker cone to push outward, not inward. Otherwise, it'll probably destroy your transformer blow up your speakers, and I want to do everything to preserve my vintage Marshall amps. All right, you guys, so I just flipped the speaker over. Uh, in order to test for the correct polarity of the speaker, you want to use a 9-volt battery, something that you probably have lying around with all the pedals that you have if you're a guitar player like myself. And all you're going to do is you're going to connect the corresponding wires into the corresponding terminals of the 9-volt batteries. So negative to negative, positive to positive. And you're going to see that the speaker is going to move forward moving upwards, which means it's in the correct polarity. So if I have white on positive, I believe, just double checking, yep. You're gonna watch the speaker move forward. You see how it moves up? That means it's in the correct polarity. But if I reverse the battery so that the terminals are now going from positive to negative and negative to positive, you're gonna watch it implode. Now it's moving down. We want all the speakers to be going forward. So another way I like to test out speakers is to measure the ohms. And the way you do that is with a multimeter. All you would do is set it to the ohm settings, which is the omega down below, which is any of these yellow entries. And because it's a low 16 ohm rating, I'm gonna set it to the lowest rating that I have here, which is 200. So all you would do is connect red to positive and the black to negative. And I, since these are all rated at 16 ohms, I'm getting a reading of, I'm getting 12.8. And you're probably thinking to yourself, that's not correct. If I'm reading less than 16 ohms, that's probably bad. It's not necessarily true. When a speaker is not connected to any current, you will always read a smaller rating than you would if current was actually being put inside the speaker. I believe it's DC voltage. Once that is introduced from the guitar amp, then this rating will go and bump up to the correct ohmage. So you really want a ballpark. It's just a couple few ohms below what it's rated for, and you'll know that it's good. And uh, here's the one from 1994. Same deal, right? Make sure that the ohms are correct. This also helps with mix match sets like this one. So because it's also rated at 16, I'm measuring 13.4. Let me show you guys. 13.5, good enough. Now I'm gonna test for the correct polarity. I need my wires again. White to the positive. And again, I'm gonna do the battery test. Hopefully it goes up. Hey, it's moving up. Just to double check, we're gonna switch the polarity and it's going down. Perfect. Oh, I hate that it's on wheels and it keeps going away from me. All right guys, now that I have all the speakers in, uh, it's a good time to talk about the jack plates. Now, the 1960 cabinets have what's called a two channel circuit in each of the cabinets, whether it's an A cab or a B cab you're usually gonna see one of these. And it is a good idea to replace these with newer ones that Marshall make because they are very notorious for breaking down. Uh, maybe it's just from over the years. Maybe it's just from bad solder joints. Out of all the 1960 cabinets that I have, which I think I've purchased about six of them so far, four of them needed their jacks to be replaced. And the reason why is because even though it might be wired correctly, these can still send the incorrect 
homages to your amplifier, which can also cause a lot of problems, malfunctions, and that's a huge no-no. So let me wire this up real quickly like it would normally, and I will show you why it's a good idea to get these replaced. All right, guys, so I have the cabinet all wired up now. Uh, I have the brand new input jack, and like I said earlier, these are dual channel circuits, but essentially you get four different options on how to use this cabinet. And a lot of people have a lot of misunderstandings on how this thing actually works, so let me just break that down for you right now. When the switch is on the left, that means it'll be read as mono. And mono, you'll be using the top settings at the very top of the input jack. I should only be plugging one speaker cable into either jack. And on the left input, that means it'll be wired as four ohms, and the right input will be wired as 16 ohms. But when you switch the jack over, that means it's gonna be switched into stereo, and that's gonna be marked down below of the switch. That means that the settings for stereo are gonna be at the very bottom of the input jacks, not the top, which means that the inputs will be divided in two, which is why you get two 8 ohm readings on either side, which also means if you plug into the left side at 8 ohms, only the left speakers will be activated. And if you plug it into the right, that means only the right speakers will be activated, but it's also 8 ohms. So they're both, so both jacks are rated for 8 ohms when in stereo. This also means you could connect two amplifiers instead of one. So again, a little quick recap. If you set it to mono, that means the settings at the very top of the jacks are what you're going to be looking for. And if you want stereo, you're going to be reading the bottom because stereo is at the bottom, which means you'll be using the bottom settings. And mono, you'll be using the top settings at the very top of the input jack. But again, let me show you why you want to use a brand new one. All right, guys, now that I have the cabinet all wired up, I'm going to show you the readings and how to test this thing to make sure it's wired correctly. So I'm going to set the jack to mono. I'm going to plug in a speaker cable, not a guitar cable or an instrument cable. They are two very different things. And then I'm going to plug that in into the right input. And because it's on mono, I want to see something close to 16 ohms, like 13 or higher. And I'm going to get up my multimeter. I'm going to connect the black to the sleeve and the red to the tip because that is my positive. And I am reading, let me hold that for you. I read 13.7, which is very good. Now I'm going to switch it over to the left input to the four ohm setting. And I want to see something close to four. Anything like a three or higher will be perfect. So again, we're going to use Go to the sleeve and the ground. There we go. I'm getting 3.5, which is really good. Now when I switch over to stereo, that means either channel will be eight ohms and we're gonna test that out. So I'm just gonna leave it on the left side for now. And I wanna see something like that. That's, that's perfect. What is that, 6.7? 6 6.9, seven. It's perfect, 6.9, 69. <laughs> And now we could test it again by switching from the left to the right. And I'm going to test my leads again. I can't see that. What does that say? Seven? 7.1. 7 That's pretty good. Ah, 6.9. And there you go. That's when you know you have a working jack unit. Now I'm going to swap this out for the old one and we'll see what readings we get without changing anything else from the wiring. All right, so now I have the vintage unit plugged in. I'm going to set it to mono. Uh, I did change the wires for connecting the jack because I did not want to be yanking the new ones out because they're on there real good and I didn't want to damage the PCB board, but these are new wires. Anyway, let's measure. And I'm getting a reading of 128 and I did do I did not do anything wrong. Let's see what happens when I switch it to stereo. See, the stereo channel is working perfectly. It's getting seven ohms. All right, and I'm getting seven ohms on the stereo channel, which means the stereo channel is technically working, but when you plug it in to mono, and, I'm on, and I did not switch jacks, I'm getting a crazy reading of, okay, now it's dropping. See, it's, it's going wild right now. 
this should be reading somewhere between 13, 15, but now I'm getting 39, 40s. Let's see what happens when I switch it to the 4 ohm. Still on the mono channel. And that, and if that was connected to the amplifier, that load would probably blow something up. Sure, it wouldn't burst into flames, but it'll destroy your power transformer, your output transformer, vintage components that you can't get anywhere without paying an absurd amount of money. Oh my God, I can't figure this out. Okay, I'm reading four point, what is that, two? I mean, that's not too bad, but you wanna get a little lower than that because when, again, when you introduce current, that number is gonna go up. And if your amp set to four, this might go to six, which means it's receiving t half as much load than it's wanting to see. Switching it to stereo. So it looks to me like the stereo channel works because we tested both sides and I'm getting below eight, which is perfect. See, I'm getting 6.9 like I did the brand new one. So the stereo channel works, but something in the circuitry for the mono is not working. I'm sure you can probably like resolder these contact points but I'm not gonna bother. I'm just gonna toss this thing out because it's probably not worth my time and it's definitely not gonna be worth risking having to get amplifiers repaired. That also takes a lot of time and money, something I don't wanna spend. So I'm gonna get rid of this old one. Uh, before I actually put the back panel back on, I'm gonna take a pair of pliers and tighten up some of these lugs. Uh, I highly recommend if you do something like this to actually solder them because it'll make a nicer connection and there'll be less of a chance that something will go wrong like a wire coming off and you're losing connection and that'll drastically change the resistance you get out of the speakers. But because I am possibly planning on switching some of these out because some of them are in kind of rough shape, I'm, all I'm gonna do is tighten them up down a little bit with a pair of pliers. That way everything's nice and snug. Uh, another thing you got to do before you uh, put in the back is reinstall the uh, the back arm that supports the back from vibrating too much. Uh, I found out that this one actually never got drilled. So I'm going to drill a hole from the back panel to the back of this. That way nothing shakes like crazy and that everything's nice and happy because I hate when my cabs shake. There we are, and now we're ready to uh, screw this puppy down. guys thank you so much for watching i hope you guys learned a little something about how to maintain your speaker cabinets especially when it comes to the impedances i know working with analog can be a little intimidating but if you just take the time to learn how to properly manage and maintain your gear it'll last you a very long time and it'll save you a lot of trouble in the long run i had a similar problem with this in the past with my with my silver jubilee i thought i had plugged it into a bad input jack from a different cabinet but it ended up just being a bad preamp tube which was so relieving because when i measured that other cabinet i was using it was doing that thing where the impedance levels were jumping up and down like crazy and i didn't know to test it at the time so when i took my silver jubilee to the technician he told me it was just a preamp tube and i was so relieved so just a word of advice just learn how to maintain your gear and uh it'll serve you very well and by the way this is a new amplifier that i got it's a 1977 2203 JMP master volume. And I know, I know a lot of you guys are thinking that I got it because John's using it during his live performances right now. 
but actually I got it because I'm a huge ACDC fan. This is what Angus would have used during some of my favorite live performances, like in Glasgow of 78, I believe. And some people believe that this was the amplifier that he used during the recording of Power Ridge and Highway to Hell. These aren't obviously the speakers that he used, but I am looking forward to doing recreation videos for ACDC as well. And speaking of making new videos, again, like I said earlier, I am working on a JFX Empyrean comparison video with my vintage pedals. The only problem right now is this Empyrean doesn't have the correct circuits that John would have used during his live performances. But Jordan has revised some of the circuits in the new version of the Empyrean, which I'm waiting to get in the mail anytime soon. So once I get that, I could actually do a really nice comparison video for you guys. And I'll give you guys a little preview of what guitar I'll be using for the next tone recreation video. I'm going to be using this Gretsch Black Falcon that I own. So comment what song you think I'm going to be doing for the next recreation tone video with this guitar. And if you don't want to miss out on any of the new videos that are going to be coming out soon, please subscribe to the channel. And I uh, hope I see you guys in the next one. And until then, have a great day.